It's funny, Jerry, nice to see you. I was going to get home for dinner. 12 o'clock kickoff. It started. Typical Green Bay Bear game. A couple of big fouls early, and everything quieted down. Everything was going well. Three minutes left in the second quarter. Jim McMahon took the stand, dropped back, quick pass up the middle. Intercepted at the 50. McMahon, head down. I'm back watching, of course. I'm ready to get downfield to get this thing set up going the other way. I noticed the Green Bay guy running toward McMahon. And I said, I better stay here. Something bad might happen. He kept them coming. It's eight or nine or ten seconds after the play was over. This big Charles Martin, number 94, grabbed McMahon 15 seconds after the play was over, picked him up, turned him upside down, stuffed him head first into the ground. My flag hit the ground before he did. <laughs> Landed on his head and shoulder, and he was out. You could hear a pin drop in that stadium. I looked at this scenario, and my God, I've been waiting 11 years to work at home. I'm responsible for this quarterback. This kid may have been killed here on the field. I'm in real trouble. This Charles Martin pushed off of the prone body, and McMahon got up on his feet. Jim Colbert, the Bears All-Pro left tackle, who had seen this, came running from 20 yards away. He hit Martin in the back with the latest hit ever recorded in the NFL. <laughs> I went for my flag, it was down. I went for my hat, and I thought, Jesus, this is a brand new white hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not throwing this into the mud. So I stood there. Ben Montgomery, my line judge, flagged it. Two flags down. Mike Ditka. Mark Bright, what is that? Two flags, what does that mean? I said, Coach, you know what two flags means? Offset. He said, You've got to be kidding. Offset. My guy may be dead. I said, you know the rule, coach. He said, I'm going to give you the Ditka rule. He said, you offset that foul. He said, you won't get home for dinner tonight. <laughs> and this time, Martin is up on his feet. This guy's 6'5", 345 pounds. I'm 5'9", not standing in a hole up here. I grabbed this guy by the arm as hard as I could. I said, fella, you're out of the game. Let's go. I'm putting you out. He pulled away from me vehemently. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I said, if you don't come with me right now, I'm going to let the Bears kill you. He <laughs> looks like a sour cage. I took him to Forrest Greg, his coach. I said, this man's ejected, coach. Get him out of here. He looked at me in this face and said, what did he do? <laughs> Back on the field, Ditka's out there. McMahon is sitting up, breathing. Ditka walked over to me and said, Mark Bright, I want to apologize for threatening you from the sideline. We're going to do everything we can to get you safely home for dinner tonight. <laughs> Whether you offset the foul or not. <laughs> well, we kicked. We did not offset the fouls. I'd have been fired today for not doing it. We didn't offset it. We kicked this guy out of the game. And it was the first time a man had ever been ejected from an NFL game for anything other than a fight. Now, I didn't know if I was right or wrong, but I took two chances that day. The first chance was not offsetting. The second chance was ejection. The league backed both of them. I got my second Super Bowl because of that play. I took two big risks that day, made two decisions. Had I run downfield five seconds earlier, I would have missed this action. It could have ruined my career. You never know when something really important is going to come your way. On a nothing day that meant nothing in the standings, the most <laughs> important call of my entire career occurred. You never know when you get up to go out to work your game when something really important is going to come up. 
some Lee Dyer call, some wonderful call that nobody may maybe remember but the men on the game. But you will, and you'll know on that day how good you were. And that's why every play is so important. But risky business. Green Bay, Minnesota, a couple years earlier, down, ready to go out on the field, the FBI man came in, all retired security men or FBI. Who's the referee? I said, I am. He said, we've got a problem. Someone has threatened to shoot the Green Bay quarterback on the field during the first quarter. I said, that's very interesting. Why are you telling me this? He said, I called the legal office. They said, you stand right next to him. <laughs> We'd like you to stand somewhere else to <laughs> I said, you better kind of find the shooter. I'm going down to work this game. I went down on the field. Lynn Dickey was the quarterback. Jerry, how are you? I said, fine, Lynn. He said, where's your flag jacket? He said, I'm wearing a double. I said, I can't wear any with this short sleeve shirt. He said, what are you going to do when they start shooting? I looked at him and smiled. I said, I'm right behind you the whole day. <laughs> the thought was there, the risk was there, but you still go on. Now, you. Most of you have mics today, even on the high school level. You know that that mic has to be off. Every once in a while, you forget, somebody bumps into you, you forget to turn it off. And so occasionally, in the pro game, there's some foul language <laughs> spoken up there on the grip when you don't want it coming out over time. We're hurry on 1988. Washington Redskins hosting Dallas. Dallas having a really lousy year, 2 and 12. Steve Pelour, quarterbacking. Third down and four. Dallas needs his first down so bad they can taste it. And Pelour head bobs. He jerks. Dexter Manley comes across. Flags fly for defense offside. I looked over on the wings. I said, pick your flags up. I've got a false start on the quarterback. I stepped out. False start, number 16, offense. Five yard penalty, still third down. Tom Landry threw his clipboard down, he was so aggravated. Pelour, right in my face, I could feel his breath. He said, that's the lousiest call I've ever seen in my life. I've been jerking my head all day. You never called it once. Here, when I need this first down, you killed me. He said, you're gutless. You don't have the guts to tell me what I did. I turned, forgetting to turn the mic off. I'll tell you what you did. You jerked the shit out of me. <laughs> Well, 
1994, I had a rookie umpire, Chadwick Brown. Chad Brown just worked his second Super Bowl. But he was green, and he was big at 6'5", 265 pounds, ex-NFL player. Here we are, the Eagles at the 49ers. And in the middle of the third quarter, his flag comes flying in. Chad, what do you have? He's all excited. He said, I got a 15-yard face pass ball. He pulled his helmet off. He said, excellent. I said, and? I did not get the number of the follower. <laughs> I said, okay, keep going. He said, what I have to tell you now is even worse. He said, I don't know the team that committed <laughs> whether we're going to call us a 5 or a 15 yard penalty. He said, when I looked to the ground, Jerry, there were two helmets down. And he said, I can't tell you which one was which. <laughs> Just then the refrigerator of Chicago fame, playing his last year nose tackle for the Eagles. He'd been talking to Chad all day, loved him because he was an ex-NFL. Walked over to Chad and said, what's going on? He said, well, I called this ball and I, Jerry's really upset with me. I don't know who did what. He said, give me a couple of seconds. He returned five seconds later, he walked over to Chad. These two huge hulks are talking. I'm standing off to the side. He said, Chad, he said, Greg Townsend, number 94, our middle linebacker, committed that foul. And he did rip his helmet off. And it is a 15 yard penalty. <laughs> years old, I started officiating in college, working in a mural ball. Something grabbed me, just like it grabbed all of you. When I came home, I went up to a local officials association. I worked the Benebrith Touch Football League for $3 a game. The Catholic Grammar School for $5 a game. Small high school. Frost off high school, small college, 11 years into the Big Ten. 11 years, I was way up here in the Big Ten. I was so happy, people said, are you interested in the pros? And absolutely not. Because, to be honest with you, I was afraid. I mean, I had a good position in the Big Ten. I was afraid to go to the next level. What if I wasn't good enough? What would I say to my family, my friends, my fellow officials? I'll make application, but I'll never get in. There's a thousand guys trying to get in. I'll never make it. Three months later, I was in the National Football League, scared to death, petrified. Put on a crew with the famous Tommy Bell from Lexington, Kentucky. Bell was the premier referee in the NFL. I loved being with him. Everywhere he went, people crowded around him. He was just a spectacular. First ball game, he took me aside. He said, kid, he said, I know you're Jewish. He said, we've got a little problem here. He said, we've got five Catholics on this crew. <laughs> we go to church every Sunday morning, all of us together. He said, you ever been to church? I said, no. He said, what do you think? I said, well, do I have a choice? He said, yes. You'll be seated at my left tomorrow morning. No or at my right. <laughs> there I was, Catholic Church, praying in my own way that all would go well. And the game went well. It went well. The season went well. 23 years went by. 
461 NFL games. I can tell you honestly, I was in church for every one. I was afraid to work a game without being in church. <laughs> every time they mentioned Israel in the mass, my crew would turn to me and nod. <laughs> Tommy Bell retired at the end of the 1976 season, and I was made the referee on that crew. The guys had been together for years, and they knew I was a college referee, and I was as green as it could be, but they convinced Art McNally to make this kid the referee, and there I was. And then for six years, I toiled trying to figure out why this guy was so good, why Bell was so good. The 1982 season came. Now we're graded just like all of you are. The top guy gets the Super Bowl. Two and three get the championship games and on down the list. The top 11 get playoffs and the bottom six today don't. So you're competing on a blind bogey. No, you've never seen the fellas you're competing with. But it's so fair and so honest and so wonderful. And I knew I had a good season, but I couldn't beat Pat Haggerty and, and, and Ben Dreyf and all those guys. It was impossible. I'd never get a Super Bowl. It was all right. I was in the National Football League. On the day the assignment was to be made, I waited in my office all day. Art McNally, our supervisor, called me at 6 o'clock, just ready to walk out. I said, Jerry, he said, are you seated? I said, yes. He said, you're the referee on Super Bowl 17. He said, listen very carefully. I was 47 years old. I couldn't believe it. He said, call no one. Tell no one you're on this game. Call your wife. Be out to California on Thursday night. Call Western Union and confirm this game. Don't mention the game in the telegram. And he hung up. I was so excited I could hardly breathe. Called Western Union. I said, confirming January 30 assignment. Send this to Mr. Art McNally at 410 Park Avenue. The operator repeated the telegram, and then in a very warm, motherly voice, she said, Mr. Mark Bright, may I please be the first to congratulate you? You must be the referee on Super Bowl 17. <laughs> She said, no, but we know you. We see you on TV every week. You're our favorite referee, but we'll tell no one. There are only 500 operators in this office. I called my wife, my friends. I called everybody. And I, out to California we went. Oh, we were excited, everybody. It was just the thrill of a lifetime. Friday, down to business, meetings, looking at video. Friday night, a special party thrown by the commissioner. Saturday, down to business, pre-game meeting, doing everything. Saturday night, a special Catholic mass is held. I was in that mass praying <laughs> that all would go well. Well, you saw the toss of the coin. <laughs> my worst and most deadly fear occurred in the biggest day of my life. On the biggest stage, I screwed up the toss of the coin. I was so embarrassed out there that I, I wanted to be erased. I didn't want to work the game. I wanted to go. I wanted to know why I was here in the middle of this waiting and humiliating myself by lossing up the toss before the game had started. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Dale Haber, my headlinesman, came in and saved the day. We got it straightened out. Nothing was lost. I worked the game, I hardly remember the ball game. We had some great things happen in the game. I was the last man hiding in the shower, hiding, when Commissioner Roselle came in to congratulate the crew on a job well done. He said, where's Mark Bright? He said, he's hiding in the shower. <laughs> he said, gentlemen, the finest officiating in the 17 year history of the Super Bowl. And he walked over to the shower where I was hiding, parted the curtain, looked in and said, once you got by the toss of the coin. <laughs> my very dear and, and one of my best friends, Red Cashin, who was also a referee trainer, and 
who I speak to multiple times a week. It was the referee on Super Bowl XX. Everything was said. I was watching it on TV. I was excited for him. The Bears were playing in New Orleans against New England. Everything was said. Gary Fensick, Bear captain, was to call the toss. Everything was said. But at the last moment, rumor spread that Walter Payton, the great Walter, was going to retire after this game. They had to give Walter the honor of the toss. They got to everyone, but they never got to Payton. Red had the coin up at Wendy. When Captain Payton call it in the air, please. Payton was talking to Dan Hampton over his shoulder. Heard his name called, huh? He said, as the coin went up. Red heard him say, huh? Didn't know what that meant. No one would say today, Dale Hamer wasn't on this game. <laughs> Finally looked at Payton. He said, Captain, what did you call? Payton looked at him with a smile, stepped out over the coin. <laughs> I called Tails. <laughs> Who guessed that it was Tails? <laughs> I almost had my tape out that day. I almost had it. I knew that that toss was out there. I've never looked at it. Even today, I've never. But Red and I talk about it all the time. It's just embarrassing and funny. And we both commiserate. But the longer it goes, the more fun it is talking about it. Because on the biggest stage, on the biggest day, you can make a mistake, but you continue to work and you redeem yourself by putting in a great day's work. You can't sulk and you can't feel sorry for yourself because you put yourself into that position. And so you have to live with the consequences. The positives are so much more. You know, just think, seven officials, walk into a, a football game, dressed in business attire, different races, different religions, different walks of life in every way. Get in that locker room, take everything off. Out comes the magnificent zebra outfit, the most comfortable outfit you could ever wear. It's a uniform, a badge of courage. The uniform transforms you into something special. The servicemen, the policemen, the firemen, when that uniform is on, there's something special. And so are you. When that door opened and I flew out onto that football field, I felt like Superman coming out of a phone booth. I mean, it was only a football game, and in the whole scheme of life, it's just this much. But for the fans and the people that love it, big, big, big time stuff. So exhilarating. So. Red and I laughed, and of course you have to have a sense of humor. But the second ingredient is toughness. Steve talked about this. You gotta be tough, courage of your convictions. I'm on the field, Raiders playing Kansas City, Howie Long in his prime, 6'7", 275, tougher than nails, one of the most miserable guys on the field. At the end of a play, he's on the ground, he said, they helped me in that play. I said, I was looking right at it, it was not a hole. He said, I'm telling you, they got to help me. I said, I'm telling you, he didn't, he got up in front of me, he stood right in front of me. He said, you calling me a liar? I said, Howard, I'm not calling you a liar, I'm telling you it was not a hole, you're mistaken. <clears throat> Matt Nellon heard this crowd of the team around. Go ahead, Howard, punch the crap out of me. <laughs> crap out of me, go ahead, big shot. I said, take your shot right here. He was so mad, tears coming down his face. He was crying. He wanted to kill me. He said, I can't do it here, but I'll meet you out outside of the stadium after the game. <laughs> I said, I'll be long gone. <laughs> take your shot right here. He was so mad, never spoke to me the rest of the day, for the rest of the season. Following year, opening game, Raiders in Green Bay. Again, he doesn't speak to me, he's still angry. After the game is over, the Raiders are seated around the Oval Bar at the Green Bay Airport, waiting for their charter. Officials sitting in the corner, I walk through my civilian clothes, a voice from one of the stools, Mark Bright, is that you? 
Tom Flores, said, yeah, it was Mark Wright. He said, uh, I've been waiting since last year to get you off the field. <laughs> I said, we're going out in the hall now to settle this argument. It was long. He was, I saw him. He, he swiveled on that stool. He hit the ground running at top speed. I reached for my flag instinctively. <laughs> ran over, he grabbed me, hugged me, hugged me, kissed me on the forehead. He looked at his coach, he said, coach, he said, this is the toughest referee in the National Football League. He said, would you believe that this shrimp tried to pick a fight with me? <laughs> he liked me, he liked the toughness. Ten weeks later, Raiders in Seattle, big Monday night game. Somewhere in the third quarter, someone ran into me from my knocked the daylights out of me. All disheveled, sitting on the ground, hat off, seeing stars. Someone came in, scooped me up, tucked my shirt in, pulled my pants up, put my hat back on. I looked over my shoulder, expecting to see a trainer. It was long. He grabbed me by the cheeks of the behind and screams, and he said, little shrimps like you have to be protected by big guys like me. So along with the humor and the toughness, of course, comes the best, the heart. You know, we're in a position of uh, a little bit above the average person. A lot of good things come your way and you discard them. And you don't know what to do with them. After Super Bowl XXI, I got a letter from the NFL, which had been opened. Uh, they open all letters addressed to officials for security reasons because most of the letters say basically the same thing. Don't come back to our town, you son of a bitch. <laughs> this letter from Charlie Stacy, I'm 11 years old, from Scottsville, Nebraska. You're my favorite referee. Could I have an autographed picture? Let me know. My boy sends me a letter. I'm so happy. This is my first real fan letter. I was so happy. I had just come back from the Super Bowl. I sent him everything I brought back, all the souvenirs and the, the whole works. A letter. I got a call from his dad a few days later. He said, Charlie was so excited to receive it. We never thought you'd even get the letter. He said, Charlie's a special young man. He's severely crippled with cerebral palsy. He lives in a wheelchair. Football is his life. He's got a jersey with number nine on it. Whenever you work the game, on goes that jersey. He was so excited. We talked for over an hour. When I hung up, I felt so bad for this little boy who lived in a wheelchair. So good I had touch with him. And I wrote to him the following week. And every other week till the season came back. And a game we get programs, and I sent him a letter, put the program in there, guys on the crew would write something, back to the city that I live in, Chicago, right to the post office and mail. It was just, it was a thrill to let him know interesting things that happened that nobody knew about. We started to talk on the phone every once in a while, got an audio tape from me and his dad. I found out when his birthday was. We, we connected. It was wonderful. So good. I got a playoff that year in Denver. And I got four tickets and I called his dad and I said, I'm sending Scottsbluff, Nebraska is only about two and a half hours from Denver. I sent him the tickets. I said, if the family can come, it would be so wonderful to meet everybody. Well, the weather was wonderful. I wrote a letter to Jim Sakamano, who was still the PR director. This was 1987. Telling him about the family and that we would meet him. 1.30 for a 2 o'clock kickoff, just to the right of the Denver bench. And there was the family. The mom, the dad, little Charlie in his dad's arms, and the sister. I met them. They gave Charlie to me over the fence and carried him out on the mile I stayed in. They walked him all down the bench line. They gave him a box of souvenirs. He was so excited. John Elway brought him back. Gave him a big hug and a kiss. He gave him back to me. I hugged him and kissed him. 
Gabe knew his dad over the fence and went upstairs to get ready for this game. Came down just before the toss. His dad was at the fence. He said, this is the greatest day of Charlie's life. He's going to see his favorite team play. Never thought he'd ever see or meet his favorite quarterback. Never thought he'd ever meet you in person. And everybody kissed him. He was, had so many kisses. He told his dad he was never washing his face again <laughs> for the rest of his life. Well, his dad's recently passed away, and Charlie lives on his own. He works. How he managed with what he has is a miracle. I'm still in touch with him. He's enriched my life. You never know when something good comes your way. Try to do something about it. The benefit of being an official gives you an edge. So along with the humor and the toughness and the heart and all the wonderful things that are available to you as officials, to celebrate Georgia Officiating Day, and your association, the GAOA, I congratulate you from the bottom of my heart and tell you that I am so proud to be here and to see this kind of enthusiasm for officiating. Because remember, without us, there are no games, there's nothing. So God bless, have a wonderful clinic, have a great season if you're football, and thank you very much.